I think this is the movie theater that's like right across from the mall. Good morning friends, my name is Brandon Dayton. I am your humble narrator. Welcome back to Project Zomboid. Oh yes, I went to sleep without my shirt on last night. You want to hear more about it? Well, that's about all I have to say about it. <laughs> um, I, I woke up freezing, so health is endangered, which is not a good thing. I'm gonna go ahead and slip this sweater on. First I have to stop moving. <laughs> There we go. And uh, I'll probably warm up pretty shortly. Yeah, my health was endangered by cold, which means it's uh, getting a worse and worse idea to, to go to sleep without that sweater on. But I get hot during the day, so I end up taking it off and then uh, don't put it back on and, and everything's just terrible. Oh, these rotten bacon bits don't belong in the fridge. I'll go ahead and throw these on the floor. See, I just... I make stuff and then I put it here and I'm like I'm totally gonna come back for it and it never happens uh, With that said, let me stuff my my fresh catches into this uh, refrigerator and Hmm, that's right. I was gonna make some coffee, but I forgot the coffee Would this house be goodly enough to just have some coffee lying around? There's some chocolate too. You can make some hot chocolate Oh yeah, look at this, temperature, Fahrenheit, Celsius, oh my god, that is amazing, I I'm impressed right now, that's all I can say, I'm super impressed right now. So you can probably uh, cook things if you know how long things are supposed to cook, unfortunately I don't so I have to sit there and watch it like a mongoloid, I'm like okay, is it done yet? Is it done yet? No, it's not done yet. Wait longer. Um, I'm gonna offload all of my bottles and whatnot because I don't think I'll need water for this journey. I have all the water and sustenance I need in zucchinis, which seems like a really good idea. Go ahead and drop some books here. I'm down to half weight, which is uh, about as good as I think it's gonna get. Hmm, I should probably grab some shotguns and whatnot as well. Okay, I'll stash my fishing rod. And then, uh, today's the day. I'm gonna head towards the mall today. <sighs> deep breath, deep, deep breath. Probably won't need box of nails, probably won't need nails. All I need is some food and some weapons. And then everything else I assume that I'll find at the mall. Really quite nervous about the journey for obvious reasons. But uh, yeah, I think it's going to be just fine. I'll bring my shotgun with me. Load it on up. And uh, yeah, I'll put my saw and whatnot on the floor. This corner of the floor away from all those fucking garbage bags. Because, uh, that ain't good. I don't want to get them all mixed up, you see. Fishing rod, fishing tackle, can stay, adhesive bandages. That's basically all I need. Maybe painkillers. Sleeping tablets, no. Smoke bomb, mmm. Gets a pass. Chewing gum. Have a little bit, and we'll drop the rest. Needle, I hate to say goodbye to you, Needle, but I know you'll be right here, safe, waiting for my return. Screwdriver, painkillers, sheets, um, probably not gonna need. Let's find a, an empty shelf for some sheets. Alright. Getting nice and tram. Nice and tram! Hammer, kitchen knife, don't think I need it. I'm still wearing a skirt. <laughs> <sighs> That's pretty funny. He's pretty funny right there. Uh, there's a big hiking bag, which is not the one on my back, so I can also stick some things in there if I need to. Uh, my bat's looking in pretty good condition. It's already 9 a.m., so uh, if we're going to do this thing, we got to fucking do this thing. Hopefully I'm not going to get lost again, because uh, that's what seems to happen every time I set out for the mall. Which isn't necessarily the worst thing ever, you know. Um, 
I always end up finding something to do, somewhere to go. <laughs> it doesn't usually end up to be a big circle, um, but today it might. Who really knows? Boom. Boom. You're dead. I should put on the pants, but the skirt just offers so much freedom. Don't you understand? It's actually a kilt, technically, because I'm a man. I'm a man who wears a skirt. So it's not a skirt, it's a kilt. There's some canned soup, some trail mix. Hmm, I'm sure that'll be good at some point. There's so many zombies, like, right near my house. I'm super glad I haven't, uh, pulled the shotgun out recently over here. And there's the, the spiffos. Alright, spiffos, goodbye. We'll see you later, I'll come back for milkshake. It's gonna be delicious, strawberry's my favorite. I bet you know that by now. No you don't, because I never made myself a milkshake. But it, it's, it sounds really good. Oh, this is the, uh, the bar. Twiggy's bar. Let's, uh, let's have a little poke around in here again. I've learned some things since the last time I was here. I assume it's gonna be, uh, empty. Yeah. We've looted basically all of this already. Mmm. But I like the, uh, the supplies and things back here. This always comes in handy. Wrench, PVC pipe, binoculars. Hmm, probably not gonna need any of this. Stop trying to pick stuff up before you get to where you're going, Dayton. That's not how you, how you get the good loot, Dayton. Well, really, what other loot do I need? If you want, if you want to be real honest, I've, I've got everything in my base that I could possibly need from scrounging. I think the mall is like one of those places that, uh, you know, you just, you just want to see it. You just gotta see it, even if you have all the shit that you could possibly need. It's just, uh, a wonder to behold. A modern marvel, if you will. So uh, I'm pretty sure the train tracks are a good way to go. And we'll just... I mean, does the train go by the mall? I'm not sure. <laughs> I never I never rode on the train all the way to the mall. It might be cheaper than the bus. But, uh, yeah, I'm not from Kentucky. I don't know anything about West Point. Except that it has a lot of dogs. <laughs> There's so many dogs here. Oh, man. So, it's gonna be a long journey. I shall tell you uh, a short tale. How's that sound? Friends, this is a tale called The Maiden and the Lost Villagers. It was told to me by a man who simply went by Killer Hawk, and it goes as such. The young maiden knelt amongst the rubble and smoldering wreckage that was once her simple home. Smoke plumed into the sky and ash hung thick in the air. It stung her eyes, but that was not the cause for the tears that were streaming down her cheeks. She was in mourning. The day before last, she had departed the group of refugees and returned to her village, determined to find the bodies of her father and three brothers. It was her duty to anoint their brows with the consecrated oil and bid them farewell into the afterlife. Her father and brothers were among the few who bravely stayed behind to hold off the enemy providing precious time for her people on the east end of town to escape the massacre that had fallen upon the village. Her distraught heart was filled with confusion, for upon her arrival, not a single corpse was there to find. The sacked village lay deserted and barren, smoldering from fire and flames. Although the smoke billowed over the ground, not a single body could her eyes see. The enemy had attacked from the north, under the cover of night, and they slaughtered everything in sight. Neither man, woman, or child was spared, yet no bodies were laying on the ground. No crows feasted on the corpses that should be plenty. The words of the old widow Mihithilo came to mind. She was fond of spinning tales about the enemy, tales the maiden believed were meant to frighten young children into obedience once it was time to remain in bed. She surveyed the ruins. It was dark and hazy with no hint of life. Once a joyful habitat this was, she thought with sorrow. Curiously, she took notice of the grimy layer of soot that covered everything within the burnt-out village. She ran a single finger through the begrimed sludge and saw that it did not give the appearance of ordinary ash, 
but of mold that grew in the dark and damp places of old. This is not of nature's making, she thought. This is rotted decay that I walk upon. The edges of the mold were of the deepest black, with hints of green, but on top of its center it grew white and gray fuzzy hair that vibrated ever so slightly. It, if it were not for the irritation of the smoke, she could have sworn the mold and mildew were growing and stretching out before her very eyes. The crackling burning of wood filled the air, then without warning it vanished. All the surrounding flames immediately were extinguished, as if inhaled by an unseen giant. The mold congealed upon itself, forming vines and tendrils. They writhed on the ground before her feet, encapsulating and covering all within its reach. A soft hiss emerged from the ruins, and a dense gas swirled and rose in the air from oval and lipped mounts that pimpled the surface of the thicker limbs. It flowed like a liquid upon the soil, and clawed up the scorched beams like an animal searching for prey. The maiden brandished her broadsword with speed and skill, for having been the daughter of a great blacksmith and the youngest sibling to three boys, she knew the ways of steel better than most. The hiss grew louder still as it permeated the terrain. She backed out of the remains of her home, defenses at the ready and eyes keen to any movement in her field of vision. Cracking and snapping broke the silence as the mist billowed and rolled in. It reminded the maiden of the breaking of tree branches from the ice storms that had raged during the past winter seasons. However, this was different. These cracks and snaps were from something wet and moist. The snaps and splits grew more severe and frequent with every moment. It started to arise from all directions and abruptly reached its climax. And then all was quiet. The maiden gripped the hilt of her sword tightly. She held the mighty blade over her head in a defensive position, ready to take the head off any foe or adversary that would stand against her. She kept this stance in silence and stillness. The girl did not grow weary from the heaviness of the blade, for it was the perfect weight for her. It had been a present from her father, and created just for her and no one else. Broken was the silence from the harsh, raspy breaths of lungs filled with fluid and phlegm. The ground heaved upward and separated from wet hands that stretched up towards the sky. The lost villagers had returned. Worms and maggots still feasted on the dead and rotting flesh. Scabs tore free from wounds that would never heal and spilled pus onto the ground. The poor creatures dragged themselves out from their resurrection holes. Disoriented, they tottered and stumbled, but the scent of the young girl quickly filled their nostrils and filled them with desires and rage. Concealed with the burned wood, a lost villager fell upon the startled girl and bit down upon her neck with a ravenous ferocity. To her surprise, its teeth did not tear her skin. The bite hurt terribly, but its teeth felt soft and mushy within its clenched jaws. Several more of the villagers slashed at her, her with thin pointed fingers, and again they fell flimsy and lacking any rigidity in their blows. The answer to this riddle quickly flashed in her mind. Newly risen are these foul beasts. Their hides had not had time to harden, she thought. In a high overhead arc, she cleaved the lost villager that stood before her in two with her sword. The blade's hilt, she struck the one that held her from behind in the throat and smashed its face into a stone wall. Yet another lunged up at her and held her by the throat in an iron grip. She brought her sword up, twisted and separated its hands from its wrists. In one graceful motion, she twirled and took off the top portion of the creature's skull. An unseen villager, a child, scurried on the ground and locked its arms around her legs. It bit down hard, and she shrieked in pain as she saw blood trickle from the decayed child's mouth. She brought her blade down hard and drove its tip completely through the child's head and buried it deep into the wooden floor. Crinkling and cracking from the drying skin and hardening hides filled her ears. She knew her time was running out. The girl scanned the area for a means to escape, and in the distance she saw her only hope. An old windmill stood a short distance away. In the absence of any clear path to escape upon, its sturdy walls and the thick door would provide shelter for her immediate safety, and so she sprinted with all her might towards that haven. She would have made it too, if it were not for the ground opening up below her feet. She fell hard, her sword clanging out of her grip. Wet and cold hands clutched and pulled her deeper into the maw of the dark hole, 
Further and further she slid. She clawed at the edges of the hole, but the soggy soil slipped through her fingers. She turned, and four faces stared back at her from the shadows of the muddy pit. For the briefest moment she saw a familiar shade of green in each of its eyes. A shade of green much like her own. There was such a great sadness in those faces and a glistening of tears in each one's eyes. As quickly as it had come, blackness and mildewed film consumed all hint of color and humanity. The grasps of those gnarled hands tightened, and the maiden screamed in terror. High in the night, a strange high-pitched whirring emerged. The sound was mel melodic and beautiful. The struggling maiden turned from the dead faces and snapping jaws she held at bay and saw a twirling diamond of light approach from the corner of her eye. It streaked across the night, ricocheted off a heap of stones and shot towards the girl in a, in a downward trajectory. It spiraled missing the girl's neck by just a hair, and slashed through each creature without resistance, separating their heads from their shoulders. The maiden followed the mysterious spinning diamond of light with her eyes. It flew high into the sky and began to descend towards the ground in a large arc, until it came to rest in the hands of a boy. The boy couldn't have been more than fifteen or sixteen years of age. He stood gallantly, wearing thin and light silver armor. The object he held in his gloved hand was a diamond-shaped disc with three blades that retracted into itself. He secured the disc to his gauntlet and drew his sword. In that instance, it appeared the mist quivered at the sight of his mighty sword. She watched him run headfirst into the approaching lost villagers. Her keen eye saw that the boy was well trained, but he had lacked some experience on the battlefield. But still, the lost villagers were no match for his blade and the amazing diamond disc. In the distance she saw another boy wearing the garb of a squire. He was accompanied by six fearsome warriors as he entered the town square. Four men and two women. They raised their spears and blades high above their head and charged forward with a loud and magnificent battle cry. The young maiden recalled the stories from the widow and the songs from the minstrels and bards. Could the tales be true, she thought? All the whispers and songs retold and sung. Was there more to those words, she pondered? Could it be true? The prophecy of the day of the worm? From within the mist, hordes of decayed creatures descended upon the small band of knights. Hissing and spitting filled the air. The clang of sharp steel against the hardened exoskeletons echoed across the barren village. The monsters fell upon the warriors from the rooftops. They leaped into the air and crawled on the walls. The beasts flanked their victims with lethal precision. The green mist swirled and surged, blinding all caught within its wake. The young warrior approached the maiden. With a smile, he offered her his hand and said, My lady, how did one so beautiful such as yourself come to find herself in such a dire predicament? She was dumbfounded, and in shock at the massacre she had just witnessed. She stood, stood aghast at the nonchalant demeanor that the boy displayed for the loss of his comrade in arms. She had never seen such a disregard for life, or such a dismissal of loyalty for those brave souls that she must have shown for this child. Puzzled, rage built within her soul, and she shouted, but, but your friends just perished before our very eyes, and you did nothing. Do you not have any... His smile grew wider than before, and the boy said, My dear, you lay before the warriors of the six realms. My, The other was a squire to my father and a champion to my mother. If any one of them was incapable of fending off a pitiful sack of flaccid deadlings, they would have no place at my side. With a slash, the squire's dagger, sl dagger slashed through the air, releasing a burst of golden light. The malignant vista evaporated into nothingness underneath its rays. In the clearing, the squire stood brandishing a brilliant blade. By his side stood two young women of no more than twenty years of age. Each held a sor short sword in reverse grip and wore gauntlets of silver and blue steel. The four men guarded the rear, an elderly man, a slightly aged man, and two young twins. At their feet lay the slashed and cut corpses of the villagers. A second wave of deadlings came at the warriors like a wave of black water. Their hard skin was glistening in the moonlight. Each of the women warriors took on two foes, blocking slashes from lethal fingers with their gauntlets and stabbing decayed flesh with their blades. The old man held a menacing dory spear capped at the rear with a heavy spike. His hair was long, white, and braided. Interwoven into the braided hair's end was a silver marble. Swings of the spear and snaps of, his, of the necks of severed heads and crushed skulls. The twins each carried a sword. 
One brother bore a copus, that is, a thick curved saber, and the other carried a xiphos, a straight double-edged sword. They guarded each other's flank and worked as one, anticipating each other's actions. The middle-aged man was blind and held a curved dagger in each hand. He slashed throats and severed limbs with the precision of any sighted soldier. The young warrior spoke with a boyish playfulness and offered his hand to her once more. Forgive me, my lady. I'm normally quite shy about things such as this, and I find rejection quite devastating. However, in this case, I will risk the embarrassment and shame. With a sly grin upon his face, he held up her sword and said, Would you care to dance with me? The maiden saw the figures moving in the shadows. She looked into the eyes of this mysterious young warrior and felt a stirring she could not deny. She smiled and took the hold of her sword and said, Yes, good sir. Nothing would please me more. And so it was. The maiden escaped with the warriors from the lost villagers. Quite a nice story. Okay, friends, we've made it to Stairplex, Starplex, whatever the hell it is. I, I think this is the movie theater that's like right across from the mall. And that dog has followed us all the way here. Maybe he hungry. Maybe we go inside and get that boy a corn dog, huh? And uh, I took my time walking basically all the way here. So that's nice that you don't need to uh, rush and arrive super exerted. You can kind of uh, conserve your energy for the uh, zombie bashing that is sure to take place while we're over here. I don't know how long I'm going to last. If I'm going to go inside, um, jeez. It is, it, it is an ugly place <laughs> over here. More zombies than I've seen in uh, my playthrough thus far, which is a little bit worrying, but um, we should be fine. We're pretty well equipped. I've got my blunt accuracy nice and high, and I also have uh, my shotgun, should things go awry. So I'm going to take a little trip inside the movie theater, and see if I can uh, find a place to settle down because I know once I get inside the mall there's not exactly any place that I can uh, sit or rest or do any of those other things that I need to do because the mall is completely open and there is sure to be uh, the shopping dead all over in there. I'm really not looking forward to it. So uh, I'm just stalling a little bit more Pause the movie uh, was playing in this theater. It sounds like a children's film, but at this point, I would I would give up anything to to see some some good old classic cinema like we talked about the last time. Oh wow, rotten ice cream! I didn't think ice cream could ever go rotten, but I guess if it melts and then uh, the milk curdles or something. Rotten hot dog! I didn't think hot dogs ever go rotten. It's full of like salt and spices and preservatives, but there is uh, chips and things, so that's kind of nice. Zombies are trying to bang down the uh, the windows outside, which is really not good. I'm gonna have to go nip this in the bud. Hey, 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 hey! Don't do that! Don't do that shit! You think that's acceptable? It's not. Lay down. Piece of cake. Could have been a, a lot worse if they ended up getting inside. So I'll need to uh, be as stealthy as possible while I'm opening my soda, you know what I mean? They might hear the little ch and then they'll come running like they do. They're pretty fucking observant for zombies. But it's, it's five o'clock. I'm trying to find a place to settle down. I probably should have brought some sheets with me, to be quite honest. And I do hear some banging still, so we'll need to, need to be careful. Are you in here? Doesn't seem like he's in here. But we are not alone. That is a fact. There's an MRE. I'll go ahead and... Uh, actually, I'll hold on to this. We have uh, arrived at the place where I can start collecting uh, goods and not feel bad about it. I really wish I could find that zombie before I decide to lay down for a little nappy nap. Or else he's gonna have some lunch. Hmm. 
Not much over here. This is all like storage room. I don't think they would need all of this shit at a movie theater. <sighs> Why you got MREs at the movie theater? You need a snack? Go, go get some popcorn. You'll be alright. There's a whole box of MREs. Fuck yeah. We haven't even gone in the mall yet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna end up loaded down before we even head in there. Dang. Wood crates and things like that. That's just fine. Box of BBs. Do I need this? I think my BB gun has plenty of BBs. Barbed wire, sledgehammer, wood crate. Ooh, that sledgehammer. That's a nice thing. I tell you what. Hmm. It seems uh, there's less banging over this way. That's kind of a nice thing. Let's have a look in the trashy cans. Nothing at all. Nothing at all! Nothing at all! I really do want to find that, that fellow. The banging fellow. Where might he be? I hear it to the left somewhere. But we've uh, been in all of these rooms. So it doesn't make much sense. He's maybe trapped in a, a theater or something like that. But I shouldn't just run around opening doors willy-nilly because uh, that's a good way to get caught up. Hmm. What other movies y'all got? Oh, this is, this is not a movie theater. This is a bathroom. I got a little lost. I am sorry. Probably the ladies' bathroom. Whoops. There ain't no ladies left to be offended. Hmm, it doesn't seem I can get around. Ooh, I see you. Sneaky Pete. Sneaky Penelope. Okay, well there's one. There seems to be just a bunch of chairs, and I see a, another zombie down that way, but um, I don't know how you get over there. Oh. Of course, you gotta go through the door. The door that doesn't exist in movie theaters anywhere. Well, that's nice. Wow. He's got a 10 mil. Hmm. I kinda do want this. I'm gonna take it just because. And, um, that basically loads up my big bag. I need to start using some of these bullets before I just start filling it all up. Filling it all up. Well, I don't hear the banging anymore, so that's uh, a good sign. Hmm. Oh, Mr. Oids or Dr. Oids had his own movie? That's fucking crazy, man. These video game movies getting big nowadays, let me tell you what. Oh, there's some more banging. We didn't get him, he just stopped. I, I really don't like the darkness of the movie theater. This is not going to be a good thing. Oh god. I think he's banging on the exit. But you can't go in the exit door, bro. That's why they got, like, the cops at the movie theaters or whatever. Um, let's just find a, a safe place to lay down. That's all I really want. Put myself behind a couple of doors. That sounds nice. Oh, this is like the projector room. Nice. Well, I don't think I'm going to find anywhere to uh, sleep up here. Maybe a chair, but I'd prefer not to sleep in a chair if I have the choice. I'll go sleep on like a movie bench or something like that. That seems like a better option. Oh, there's uh, a little drinky do. Maybe I should have brought some water bottles with me. My god. This place is just endless. Okay, so we're relatively deep inside the Star Eplex. I have made it to the mall, friends. Yes, finally. This is, uh, well, this is not the episode, but relatively soon we're gonna have a peek inside the mall, a little poke around, because I'm not going home without uh, seeing what it holds, what it holds. So, I hope that you will join me for it. 
Please don't forget to like, comment, and or subscribe if you did enjoy the video, friends. I've been Brandon Dayton, your humble narrator, and this has been Project Zomboid. And uh, if you'd like to see me on the big screen, please, please like down below. Uh, who knows, we could get uh, a, a movie like the Smosh Guys, you know? And my movie will probably suck just as hard as theirs did, but I'd appreciate it. <laughs> I could put that on my resume, slap it up there. And, uh, you know, maybe somebody will hire me, perhaps. I don't think the Smosh guys put that on their resume, either. <laughs> Anyways, I ramble. I'll see you in the next, next one, friends. Thank you so much for watching, and until then, bye! One, two, three, four, goodbye, goodbye, see you again. Goodbye, goodbye, see you, my friends.